Uh, this has really been a remarkable afternoon for me. Uh, it's one, it's an opportunity to benefit from the superb work that the faculty at Sloan has been doing. And um, I think there's a huge opportunity here to, to, to not only continue the excellent work that's being done, but to have enormous impact on a system that is desperately in need of transformation. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an overview and go through pretty quickly the, kind of the nature of the problem, which is really spending, its cost, its quality, its really value in the system. And then really focus on the changing roles that we see in terms of the role of consumers, managed care organizations, and, and providers, and then conclude uh, with a summary. I think the take home message here is that health reform has really legitimized the transformation of the healthcare system. I can tell you that before healthcare reform uh, became an important topic in America, when I went to social events and said I was involved in health insurance, people immediately passed out the pillows and no one wanted to talk to me about anything I did. As health reform unfolded, everyone wanted to talk about healthcare. <laughs> And so one of the real benefits has been the legitimization of the transformation of the system. As a result of that, the system is really going to begin to be held much more accountable for cost as well as the performance of uh, health care um, going forward. Now, th this slide gives you a sense of all of the different aspects of the healthcare industry that uh, participate as far as external forces in shaping both the cost, quality, and the value. Health reform ref impacted all of the areas in the red. And so this is one of the few times when you see an entire industry undergoing a transformation, and whether it is the pharmaceutical manufacturing, medical devices, the healthcare marketplace, you name it, there is a lot of external work going on. Now, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, ACA, really has been mostly about access and expanding coverage to healthcare. And it has really done very little to date in terms of cost and healthcare delivery. The biggest forces at work in this area really have been the private employer-sponsored insurance system in the country, principally driven by the Fortune 100 employers who themselves self-insure and are responsible for the cost of their employees. Now, in terms of the ACA, um, one of the things that we see, and we've got some kind of new um, data coming in, but the takeaway is that about 23 million people have insurance today, speaking about, say, roughly February 2015. Some of those were young adults who were, were covered up to 26. Some were about, I'd say about 11 million or so, close to 12 million are consumers who purchased in the new marketplaces. Some of those people had insurance before and ended up just purchasing it in, in the particular um, exchange. And then there were others who purchased it directly from insurers. We still have an enormous number of people who do not have insurance in the country, and so we do have more work to do in access, but access was really what it was about. This is a slide most of you have seen. Takeaway here is we spend an enormous amount. This shows what we spent between uh, 08 and 14. When you go forward, we're going to be approaching 20% of GDP. Now, I don't know where the break point is, but trees do not grow to the sky. There is a point at which this will begin to squeeze all of the other aspects of our both personal budgets as well as the federal budget and the state budget. And so at this level of spending, we are going to see increasing pressure to address this issue. Now, one of the things that we get asked uh, regularly is about the cost of our delivery system relative to other uh, developed countries. And this slide has a lot of data on it, but I think the big takeaway is we spend a lot more per patient and we spend a lot more in terms of the overall cost. And I wanna dig down a little bit on this and really focus on this slide. Because one of the questions is always why? Are we doing more services? Are we 
using higher technology, more frequency. And the reality is when you really begin to peel it all back, it really turns out to be driven principally by prices. Now, prices doesn't take into account the utilization of those healthcare services. But it really turns out to be driven in the US principally by pricing factors. And one of the questions I think someone asked earlier was a question about we are a wealthier country. And is that one of the reasons we spend so much more on health care? This is a great analysis that was done a few years, a couple of years ago. And it took into account what the estimated spending should be based on the wealth of the U.S. relative to other countries. And what you can see in the total spending is that about 23% of the spending would be excess relative to the wealth effect in the U.S. And you can see how that breaks out by the different categories, outpatient care, inpatient. And one of the one areas, one area that we spend less than other countries is actually in long-term care and care in the home. So we're overspending in, in these other categories and underspending in that category. Now, one of the questions I often get is, well, why is it that we are spending so much? What's driving it? And I think one of the factors is when you look at what physician compensation is in the US, it is much greater than it is in other countries. Now, in fairness to physicians, we have the world's worst method of financing physician education, I think, of any country I know, because physicians have enormous debt when they graduate, and they need income to be able to pay off that debt. But the reality is, if you contrast Australia, which where a, a physician would earn about 92000 to the U.S., where it would be 186000 that's a pretty dramatic difference. Also, when you look at specialists, and one of our big differences is our delivery system has more specialists and less primary care. Other systems tend to have the opposite. They have more primary care and fewer specialists. And so you can see that an orthopedic surgeon in the U.S. actually does pretty good relative to an orthopedic surgeon who happens to practice in Australia. Now, um, when you look at kind of what the government pays in terms of versus what the commercial or employer-based insurance or private payers pay, we have another problem because we have a bit of a cost shift. If you just take the US, public payers, which includes Medicaid and Medicare, would pay $60, and the private payers pay $133, and they are, in effect, subsidizing, they believe, the underpayment from the point of view of the uh, public payers. And you can see the same thing is, is in effect when we look at specialty care. This would be hip replacement. You can see that public payers would pay about 1600 in the U.S. versus almost 4000 would be what a private payer would pay. And so that is one of the uh, important contributing factors. Now, this is a way to shift from the physicians to the hospitals and look at what hospital services cost in the selected countries. And again, you can see that by and large, our hospital um, services cost a lot more. Now, some of this has to do with, um, again, the lack of investment in the home health care structure in the U.S. A lot of it also has to do with consumer expectations and choice and preference in the U.S. And I often uh, ask um, how many people would send their child to a hospital that didn't give them a single occupancy room. 